I just wanted to explain before we go into this uh, venture what uh, this uh, point cloud modeling is about. We founded seven years ago the ETH together with Professor Gray Rigame, a uh, laboratory bridging engineering and architecture. It was uh, supported by the Swiss National Science Foundation and the school board, the ETH school board. And what happened is that we transferred a technology that was privy to uh, engineers and surveyors and brought it into the realm of modeling. And the way we argued with the, the Swiss National Science Foundation is we basically said, well, there's no such thing as a landscape modeling laboratory at the ETH, but uh, not even in Europe or probably worldwide. We'd like to bring this sort of large-scale modeling uh, uh, from the virtual world into a reality and make it accessible to younger generations of researchers and students. So that's actually what we did. What you're going to see is going to require a little bit of a gymnastic to understand how this sort of uh, visualizing occurs. But actually what you're looking at in this picture is a still picture of a model. It's a gigantic digital model showing the entire alpine chain ranging north-south over the Gotthard. Before we start, I think that we should define first what a point cloud is made of. It's actually made of millions, if not billions, of pixel points. The pixel itself is a recent word in the history of mankind. It appeared in 1967 at NASA, actually in the Jet Propulsion Lab, Billingsley, when they satellites and, uh, and uh, spatial missions were sending back electronic image to Earth. And it simply means picture element. It's the smallest unit, visible unit, on a digital image or screen. It goes back, actually, to 19th century theories. A German person called Paul Nipkow first talked about a Bildpunkt. But basically, that's what the entire cloud is made of. So what is a cloud? It's basically a set of points that carry information. Each point carries, in a way, a position relative to its neighbors, and the black space in between is simply no information. And as I said, until recently, these data sets, these point clouds, were used by very serious engineers, civil engineers mostly, to draw precise technical plans and elevations on construction sites like dams and other things. And the image itself, or the model itself, was never made fully. The information was extracted, and 99% of the point cloud information was thrown away. What happened with this laboratory is that we bridged the two fields, engineering and creative architecture, and kept the entire data sets as they were, and started working with these unwieldy models that count billions of points. Basically, each point carries the famous uh, GPS coordinates, the X, Y, Z, that is to say it's lat latitude, longitude, and elevation. And you have within this family of point clouds these so-called control points that anchor the entire cloud in precision, and we're talking about millimeter in, in terms of height or width. The position is within millimeter precision. These control points are actually riveted to a series of satellites that go around the Earth and really give that fixed position. The control point also helps to bring different sets. We use drones, we use uh, terrestrial lasers, we use uh, LIDAR, mobile cars that register elements, and these control points allow us to bring things together. So much for the technical explanation. I think the best way to explain that is to start again with the point within a point cloud so that you can understand the sort of phenomenon that I call transductive scale. What, what happens is you can go from a minute scale of an object to the very broad scale of a territory seeming, seamlessly. And that's quite extraordinary. So let's start our journey. Here we're going to see a pixel point retracting into the virtual digital space of the new NEAT tunnel. This is actually a data set that was given to us by the Alp Transit of the entire new high-speed rail tunnel in Switzerland, the longest in the world. And here we're retracting out of the south portal, which is in Bodio, very slowly. And we're going to pull out at the scale of an object. And as we go up in the air, we're going to literally start seeing, and this is all a 
point cloud data set, we're going to start seeing the model in a much bigger picture of the environment. Uh, here you even see raindrops falling on the tunnel entrance. They were scanned. Um, the forest, the mountains adjacent to that, etc. So what's extraordinary with the point cloud when you use it as a general data set is it's a virtual model, it's a still image, but it has extraordinary precision. This is just the section of the model that we've been scanning at the uh, ETH over the last seven years at the uh, Landscape Modeling and Visualizing Laboratory. What you see, this sort of strange little streak on the upper part of the, the plan picture is actually the data sets that we took. They're embedded in a Swiss Topo data set. And what you see underneath is the section through the mountains with that high-speed tunnel going through. If you look at the screen, you also see that hair-thin line in the middle of the picture, which is literally the tunnel that you see in semi-transparency through the pixel points of the model. This is the tunnel. You all know it. It's been very highly publicized since its inauguration last June. It is quite unreal. One really doesn't know whether one is under the ocean or under the mountain. The relationship to the landscape has been, in a way, lost here. And of course, when you look at what has happened with this highly technical sort of device, uh, is that you can cross the Alps in roughly 20 minutes. It used to take two weeks when Goethe went over the Alps. And basically what you see in grey is the entire mountain landscape having disappeared. What's good, though, is that the a Swiss train company, the SBB, has provided for us uh, a virtual compensation. They have within the trains, as you cross the tunnel, monitors that talk about your new horizon. It's labeled underneath each screen. And probably it's the absence thereof that means that the new horizon appears on a virtual screen. So what should we say about that? I think we're going to go back to the point cloud to try and understand how it actually works as a model and as a piece. And I think the best way to designate that is to explain that the model is like a crust. Here we're just south of the Gotthard going down. We're monitoring the earth crust. It's really showing in the most intricate details the old Tremola Road and the new Tremola Road. It's almost like a big cake, a digital cake, which is empty underneath. It's just really showing the surface in the most intricate detail. What you're going to start seeing now, though, is the tunnel below that line that appears in transparency, which is actually the Autobahn tunnel, the first tunnel that we're going to see. And it's appearing in transparency through the crust. The second line above that looks like a, a cloth hanging line is actually the Neat tunnel, which is further uh, east. And as we cut through that model, as if we were cutting through a piece of cake, we see with exact geographic position the depth of field with the two tunnels below the Earth crust. That's quite a bewildering image. And that's where these point cloud data sets are actually producing a sort of revolution of sorts. Again, the point cloud is a surface that is georeferenced and that really shows an extraordinary amount of texture. Here you see the texture in front of the terrain, but you also see the transparency of the entire mountain chain behind. It goes all the way to the Matterhorn on the far left. This is part of the model again, and here we see the journey north to south. So I'll just let you travel. We're going to go through the portal that we just saw before. What's extraordinary with this vision is that we actually come down and within the recognizable human scale, we see things in very, very precise positioning. I think that's what's the most important thing. Here we're going to get to the portal that we just left a few minutes before. And what you're going to see very quickly is the portal and then the double pipe of the train line veering to the right under the mountain crust and then shooting into the mountain itself transparently. Here we're going up the hill towards the Gotthard and then we'll come down over the Devil's Bridge. Below, you see the motorway tunnel in transparency. That's really what's absolutely fascinating with these models. So it's actually a massive scale digital model that can be used. Here we're arriving on the Gotthard again. 
And then we go down again with the Autobahn bridge underneath and the Gushenen uh, Schlucht, the Devil's Bridge, the well-known Devil's Bridge on the bottom of the picture, etc., going through. We've been deploying techniques like drones before they were celebrated. That was 10 years ago. Uh, now they're sort of ubiquitous. We've been using the LiDAR system. We even reserved the Autobahn tunnel for ourselves, closed it off and measured it. We even have been going to very cold places. This is Matthias scanning the Gotthard. What I think is really important to understand is how this really works and what its applications are for the future. It's not just a nice-to-have model of the Swiss Alps. Here we can literally work as engineers sectionally. We're going to cut through the infrastructure that pours out of the uh, Alps in Göschenen. And here you see a very, very precise section showing how the motorway, the railway bridge, etc. works. And the applications there have been multiple. We've worked in Southeast Asia, in Jakarta, monitoring flood problems in slums, We've been rebuilding artificial islands in Venice with the same technology. We've been working in Israel and Jordan on the uh, Nahar Yarim site to document archaeological elements. And basically, what we're able to do with this type of modeling is not just map the Alps, but actually simulate flow, uh, simulate new projects, and use it almost as a tool of participation. We've trained hundreds of young researchers and students for it, and I think that's really the goal of this laboratory. So, uh, basically, the entire team behind the Gotthard project, which was shown, uh, by the way, in the Venice Biennale uh, uh, two years ago and will be shown again at the ETH Center at the beginning of next year, in June, uh, is actually the result of a huge amount of collaborations. I thank you for your attention.